I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to speak about that meditation and meditation in general for a moment here. Um, in very important kinds of meditation that are called open awareness practices or different things in different traditions, such as just sitting in Zen, uh, what we do when we, when we meditate is we really open out into simply being present with sometimes called choiceless awareness or just simply abiding. And one of the most powerful aspects of that uh, or beneficial aspects of that form of meditation is we start to, we in the broadest sense, start having uh, experiences of what it's like when there's very little sense of self. There's very little sense of deliberate effort in the mind, uh, passing thoughts of me, or more like clouds, wispy clouds moving through the sky of awareness. And that itself uh, helps us become more aware of what it's like to, to not be that contracted entity, but rather be opened out into everything. Uh, and as that practice of open awareness matures, there can be a growing sense of immersion in or identification with or abiding as what can start to feel like a field of awareness that is transpersonal. Okay. Other major categories of meditation and contemplative practice uh, are broadly termed focus attention practices. We might describe them as concentration practices or shamatha practices or absorption practices in which we deliberately rest attention on something to become increasingly absorbed in it and to uh, cultivate that quality inside ourselves increasingly over time. So we might seek to become increasingly absorbed um, in a sense of tranquility as one of the seven factors of awakening, or increasingly absorbed in a sense of happiness, which is one of the factors of moving into the jhanas, uh, which are the elements of the wise concentration uh, aspect of the Eightfold Path. Or we might deliberately meditate on gratitude or a sense of feeling content. So there's no basis really for grasping and craving because we feel already content. Or we might want to rest on kindness or compassion or other wholesome qualities, wholesome factors uh, of everyday functioning as well as awakening over time. Both of these kinds of practice are really important. Open awareness practices and um, uh, concentration practices or absorption practices. Uh, in this particular meditation that we did, I was exploring with you what it's like to, in some ways, combine them. To begin with a sense of simply being, which involves a kind of openness, and then over time start to observe that sustaining that sense of agendaless uncontracted, undefended, unegoic sense of being is biologically, frankly, uh, really aided by helping the animal of the body feel safe enough and satisfied enough and connected enough in the present. So we have a mingling here of um, an opening into simply being, combined with attention 
to our own biology and our own primal tendencies toward contracting in fear, frustration, or hurt, or loneliness, which then drives craving. So in a meditation, we can combine those so that with repetition, as you repeatedly dwell in a mingling of ongoing being, mingling with uh, a sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love that undermines con craving, that leads to suffering, wow, that becomes increasingly the habit of your heart. More and more, your repetition, those states of presence with little craving, feeling already full, those states become your traits. That becomes increasingly what you're rested in, including when life is challenging. Sometimes these two different sorts of meditation are framed as opposed to each other. In the most extreme forms of just sitting, just being, uh, you're making no deliberate efforts at all. You're, you're simply falling open and you know the only effort you're making is to sustain that kind of fallen openness. That's great. It's also very taught by the Buddha. If you look at, um, for example, the four foundations or four establishments of mindfulness, classic instruction in mindfulness. Um, so much of the progression uh, in, um, in, in, the, in those teachings there, in the Satipatthana Sutta, involves a growing absorption in various wholesome factors of mind while being mindful of them. We are mindful of them, but to, we're mindful of them as they persist <laughs> in awareness. So we become increasingly absorbed in them. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So as we sustain mindfulness of tranquility or bliss or happiness um, or love or compassion, we become increasingly um, uh, full of that experience. Does, does this make sense? I think it makes sense, it's a roadmap, it's a way to understand it, it's a way to combine these two practices. So people ask me sometimes, um, you know, I'm using language and phrases like open-hearted. Any kind of instruction is, is culturally situated. What I mean by that is that I use language from the early Buddhism, mainly, and also I use my own version of it. So uh, I find for myself, that sometimes it's hard to uh, drop into love. <laughs> you know, you could challenge yourself. You start seeing people on the television set, you know, whose politics you don't like, or your neighbor or your, your partner. Love, it's pretty far, it's, you know, it's out of reach. But to have a sense that your heart is open, right? Or maybe you walk down the street, you, you see a stranger passing by, it's, it's not really authentic to say, oh, I love you, but to realize as they walk by that you can, um, you can uh, be present with them with an open heart. So what do I mean by that? Uh, it's a sense of openness, a sense of heartfeltness, uh, not running a game on them, not, uh, not trying to manipulate them or mistreat them, uh, Open-heartedness naturally draws us into an I-thou kind of relating with whoever we're with. We're, we're open-hearted. We're open about it. The heart is open. But if you don't relate to that language, find your own. Yeah. Whatever helps you disentangle from craving. You know, disentangle from anxiety and anger and powerlessness in terms of our need for safety. Whatever helps you. Disentangle from frustration or disappointment or, you know, addictive compulsions for our, in terms of our need for satisfaction. Whatever helps you and whatever helps you uh, disentangle from shame, feeling inadequate, uh, disentangle from resentments and grievances toward others, disentangle from ill will toward others. 
in terms of your need for connection and, and rest instead in love. Whatever helps you do that, that's skillful means for you. And having a kind of alive, intentional orientation to your own practice is really useful. What are you seeking to disentangle from? And what are you seeking to dwell in increasingly? And how are you helping yourself do that over time? You know, we can get very complicated about practice and kind of wonder about things. At the end of the day, what are you seeking to let go of and release from? And what are you increasingly cultivating as the habit of your heart? And how are you helping yourself do that? Those questions cut through a lot of yakety yak um, and and can be really useful. All right. So I would like to talk with you tonight about something that is not as well formed as many of my talks. And so I'm asking for your forgiveness and understanding coming into it. And it has to do with this. If you look at the history of Buddhism, um, in early Buddhism, uh, represented by the Pali canon, the canon of teachings in the, a language, a key language of early Buddhism, Pali. There are other versions and translations of those core teachings in Sanskrit, as well as in particular in Chinese, uh, but it's generally referred to as the Pali canon. Okay, In those teachings, there is a lot of instruction about how to be. It's quite specific, um, how to speak, how to act, um, how to be mindful, uh, how to be virtuous. A fair amount of it has a kind of prescriptive quality. You know, the fingers pointing at you, be this way, do this thing. Uh, do not do the least thing that the noble ones, the wise ones would reprove. That's a quotation from the Pali Canon. It has that quality to it. And then as kind of a, in part, uh, resistance to that or evolution of that combined with other things, we had the development of the Mahayana schools of Buddhism as Buddhism over, you know, particularly by a thousand years, that's a long time, after the Buddha lived and thought and taught, uh, you know, as Buddhism kind of evolved and spread through Tibet and into China and then into Asia and Japan, uh, and then onward to the West, uh, a fair amount of that kind of uh, prescriptive aspect of Buddhism was, particularly in Zen and Chan, was uh, kind of set aside uh, in, to, in favor of a more immediate immersion in the ground of all as the essence of practice with a kind of a, uh, a view about some of that prescriptiveness as, um, you know, being an intermediate vehicle, but not the ultimate vehicle, a lesser vehicle, Hinayana, or compared to Mahayana, uh, and so forth. So I want to, in that context then, look with you and explore with you something that's been really powerful for me personally in the last few days. Uh, and... It has to do with this quotation that I'm going to put into the chat for you to see. So this is from the Dhammapada. Uh, historically, a collection of teachings that were probably pulled together after the Buddha himself passed away, but are certainly close to his his mind stream and the teaching stream he was part of. So let's focus thing here on this. Easy to do are things that are bad and harmful to oneself, but exceedingly difficult to do are things that are good and beneficial. Now, I previously had read that teaching multiple times because I receive it since I subscribe to Pariyati, and I'm gonna put Pariyati into the uh, chat for everyone to see. Uh, you too 
might like to get their teachings of the day. Pariyati. And donate to them as I do and support what they do. So I've I've read that teaching multiple times. And I usually in the or in the past, I have taken it as a kind of Buddhist finger wagging at me. Hey buddy, it's easy to hurt yourself. It's hard to do the best you can by yourself. Straighten up. <laughs> do the right thing. Don't do the wrong thing. Rise and shine. <laughs> right? And, you know, maybe that's suited to my personality. Like, yeah, you know, kind of a go for it, excellence orientation kind of person. Uh, recently, though, and this is what I want to really invite you into is the recognition of taking it literally that it's hard to do things that are good and beneficial. It's hard. And when you look back on your life, and this is what I'm inviting you into, and this is what's been very real for me recently, if you look back on your life with the scorecard you keep and the criticism of yourself, and a sense of falling short, and you know the shoulds that you fell short of. What happens when you realize and you you believe you recognize that? Wow, it's hard to do all those things right, and so understandably, you're not going to do them all right. I sure haven't. When you start to realize that the standards we set for ourselves are hard to maintain, they're challenging. So yeah, full credit, full credit for meeting them. So we're getting the best of both worlds here in what I'm trying to talk about. Full credit for meeting those standards day in and day out that are exceedingly difficult to do. Awesome. And also, can there be some slack for yourself, some easing, some forgiving of the falling short. The point here is not to um, support and becoming a total selfish goofball, no. It's to realize what happens when you realize that so many of the standards you've kept for yourself, how you look, how you speak, every little thing, uh, including what you're trying to do inside your own mind. <sighs> what happens when you realize that that is objectively really exceedingly difficult to do? That's the exploration I'd like to invite here. Feel free to offer comments in the chat. If you use the chat, please focus on your own practice, sharing your own, pardon me, sharing your own experience. And even if it's exceedingly difficult, please uh, avoid criticizing others or giving them advice or educating them uh, or selling them on anything, okay? So I'm asking you here for real, What is it like and what would support you in the combination that uh, this teaching that I put in the chat is about? What would support you in going for it in terms of what your aspirations are while at the same time cutting yourself a break, giving yourself a break, cutting yourself some slack about, wow, how hard it is to be nice all the time, you know? How hard it is not to yell at people. How hard it is to stop at two beers. How hard it is to uh, get yourself to meditate every day, you know? It's hard. I don't know. When this started landing on me, including in some key relationships where I've been really hard on myself, uh, just really reflecting on uh, mistakes I've made in them, 
that I regret and are difficult to repair, sometimes impossible to repair, to realize, you know, we're human, we're animals, we're a mess. <laughs> so, what do you make of this? Please put some comments in the chat. I'm happy to talk with somebody uh, or one or two people maybe briefly just about it, but I really want to invite you into this kind of reflection. You know, and so um, one thing you could do about it, if you'll do it with me, is to, you know, if you're old enough now to have some decades under your belt, let's do this together for about half a minute. This will be like a whirlwind tour through your life, and you can go at your own pace, all right? So imagine yourself zero to 10, <laughs> covering a lot of ground here. <laughs> and just take a moment to talk to that kid in your mind who's still here. And just acknowledge how hard things were for you. And in your own way, whatever you experience is fine. See if you can find kind of a surge of forgiveness, uh, blessing, commiseration, understanding, respect for yourself. Right? Zero to ten. All that you are dealing with. And then how about 10 to 20? That includes the teen years, junior high school, transition to adulthood, struggles with parents maybe, leaving home, struggles with peers. You know, if I were to sum up a sentence or two for myself that you can try on yourself, it would be something like, Wow, kid, <laughs> maybe use your own name. Wow, so-and-so. Wow, you were dealing with a lot. Considering everything, wow, you did great. And I forgive you any falling short. You were doing, you were dealing with a lot, considering everything. You did really well. And I forgive you any falling short. Can you communicate that to yourself and receive it into yourself? This is particularly important around times in your life that you might feel ashamed of or guilty about or, you know, that you just drop the ball. Okay. Let's try it again, 20 to 30, if you're old enough. Establishing yourself in the world First jobs, major relationships, maybe relationships and careers you've stayed with. It's a crucial time in people's lives, early adulthood. So many good decisions, so many bad decisions.
Can you look at that person you were with essentially these three statements in your own way? Wow, so much you were dealing with, so hard. Second, considering everything, you did so many things well. And third statement, I forgive you any falling short. Can you imagine being that 25-year-old, 22-year-old, 28-year-old, who's suddenly hearing like the voice of God, (laughs) you, (laughs) talking to you back in time? What it would be like for that young version of yourself, part of yourself, to really hear the recognition of things that are hard, the recognition of what you're doing well, and, and a kind of forgiveness. And then how about when you're 30 to 40? And if you haven't lived that long, you can imagine the future you, right? Can you reflect on choices you made in your 30s? Often a maturing of a person's work. um, Sometimes things falling apart, and then reorganizing key relationships, mistakes in relationships, perhaps becoming a parent. Can you look at yourself during those 10 years, that crucial decade, and just think, wow, it was hard, hard for anyone. So many challenges. Considering everything, saying to yourself, you did so much, you did so much well. Good on you. What a tough decade was for me. And can you forgive yourself during that decade for ways you fell short? Yeah. And then how about your 40s? Age 40 to 50. Lots of turning points in that decade. Lots of challenges often. Sometimes health issues starting to come online. Uh, Relationship issues, divorce, um, teenagers, disappointments in career. Doors starting to close irrevocably sometimes of different kinds. A lot of challenges. Hard. Can you give yourself a break for those challenges? You 
it was hard. Considering everything, you did really well, and I forgive you any lapses. I understand them and forgive them. Can you say that to yourself? This can be very far reaching and very deep, very healing. Obviously, of course, you can take more time with this on your own if you like. I'll keep moving. How about your 50s? Again, if you're not yet in your 50s, you might look ahead to the challenges of that time. In your 50s, age 50 to 60, can you recognize challenges, things that are hard? and appreciate so much of what you did that was good, and forgive yourself where you fell short. It was hard in your 50s. Things were hard. And then in your 60s, 60 to 70. I'm 71, so that decade, 60 to 70. Health issues, people you know dying, probably your parents passing away. Um, Kids leaving home, a lot of going on. Financial tension, tight, you know, concerns. You're seeing the end of the runway. It's hard. It has been hard. Considering how hard it is, really appreciating what you've done well and forgiving the rest. Those three. Yeah. And then finishing up. Forecasting for myself, and perhaps others are now looking back in your 70s, even your 80s. A lot of hard things, a lot of challenges, exceedingly difficult. And yet, wow, so many things done well. So many challenges overcome. Can you forgive yourself your lapses while still encouraging yourself to really do your best every day? That's the sweet spot. And realizing how truly di exceedingly difficult it is, can help you both be gentle and kind and nice to yourself. I'm trying to listen to my own advice here, 
uh, about what's exceedingly difficult. And because it's difficult, really encourage yourself to do your best every day. And I hope you let in, I'm hoping I let in, whatever seems wise and true and useful in what we've been doing here. Okay. Great. So I see a Lev. You've raised your hand. I saw you raise your hand two weeks ago, and then I, I couldn't find you. Uh, you might have raised it accidentally. So I'm asking you to unmute, and hopefully you'll turn your camera on. I think you may have raised your hand accidentally. So let me take a peek at what's come in on the chat. And I hope this has been helpful to, for you. And just to recap, we can recognize how truly exceedingly difficult many things are. We can really appreciate how well we did considering. And we can understand with forgiveness our own lapses while, as we go forward, maintaining a forgivingness for ourselves while continually encouraging ourselves to do our best each day. Okay. So I'm checking out um, comments in the chat. I really appreciate, Tina, your comment at seven minutes past the hour about breathing room. Whew. Giving ourselves room to breathe. Okay. Yeah. Letting go of perfectionism. Jennifer points that out at nine minutes past. Yeah, Amy, wow, what a comment at nine minutes past. Uh, Rick, that is so powerful, especially when others were the ones imposing the demands and judgments of falling short. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, we dance to other people's tunes so much. And I think right here at Thoreau's line, we have the beat of a different drummer for ourselves. So it's really especially important if you've internalized, as I did, a lot of um, aspirational standards uh, from my from my mom in particular, uh, and uh, realizing that we can still, you know, encourage ourselves to to do our best each day, while realizing doing your best is exceedingly difficult each day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. May we cease from beating ourselves up. Malaya, so hard to breathe. Right. We can feel so tight. The performance demand, such a burden. So important to realize that the load is heavy. Oh, you know, boom. Can we, Atlas shrugged, right? Can we sort of, Move, shrug and oh, so much weight. It's funny. So often, uh, I can say that in my own life, much of what I did that was bad was a side effect of the pressure I was under to do good. If you kind of follow that, and I think that's true for a lot of people. You know, that it's so hard to breathe, that pressure on us to aspire, to attain. That's what leads us to drinking too much or, you know, uh, yelling at people or, you know, getting into trouble or acting out sexually or, you know, et cetera. Um, 
you know, it's kind of a side effect of the squeeze. We're in the squeeze. And so ooh, the, <laughs> this stuff oozes out over here, but the it does so because of the squeeze. You know, I think of, uh, I've had experiences of imagining being with the Buddha or other teachers. I know I spoke with a woman recently who, a deep Christian, and for her, it's it's Jesus and the inner, and the, the being of Jesus, the energy of Jesus. So we can imagine a, a being, whoever that is, um, looking at us. How do they look at you, right? With courage and clarity and clear seeing and kindness you know with a that combination of forgiving and encouraging forgiving and encouraging but it includes the encouraging includes the forgiving and the forgiving includes the encouraging the two together that can be very powerful to imagine beings like that a being like that with forgiveness and encouragement for you, washing you clean while encouraging you onward. And I wanna say a word about forgiveness. I see Ivana's comment at 12 minutes past the hour. Um, forgiveness is, is a powerful word. Um, we can release punishing ourselves while still wincing in remorse whenever we think about that thing. You know, we can let go of preoccupation and rumination in which we are actively feeding that topic in our minds, and we can give ourselves permission to turn a corner from it after having fully taken responsibility and done the best we can, can and made all the efforts we possibly can to repair, uh, then others, you know, may not want to participate in repair. You know, then we can turn. So for me, forgiveness includes that uh, self-forgiveness, where you realize, wow, there was so much that was in it, wince of remorse, big lessons learned not going to keep beating myself up about it. No point in beating myself. It's just cruelty. It's just piling on punishment past the point of any usefulness to keep beating yourself up about it. That's a really important point. Okay, finishing up. Yeah, thanking, I'm seeing Nicole's comments and Laurie's, thanking ourselves, thanking these younger versions. We are right now ourselves the handing off again and again and again of those young, those younger yous up to the you yesterday or earlier today who's handed off this moment of, of being. Looking back, oh, it was hard for them, those younger yous. They were under so many pressures, so many people nudging and jostling and pushing them this way and that, getting tugged this way and that, still being affected by stuff that happened in utero or, you know, in the first six days of your life and oh, all that. Looking back at them, thank you. Thank you, you all. Wow, thank you. You were dealing with so much. Thank you. All the folks, all the previous earlier versions of you. What's that like? Yeah. I see balloons rising, Claudia. Yeah. Okay. I hope this was helpful. Uh, I was more I forgive myself for being <laughs> less planned than I often am. And it's very alive for me, this, the, this, this joining of forgiving and encouraging, forgiving and encouraging 
applied to ourselves and internalizing the forgiving, the blessing of that forgiving, which in a way is freeing and releasing of what holds us back from being carried forward by the encouraging. 